Apple is engaged in a war that will either kill the web as we know it or break up the company. It's under assault from every angle and their walled garden is starting to show cracks. The web has become Apple's greatest enemy as Google is seizing more and more control over it. No one is the hero in this story and everybody loses in the long run. Apple's rule against other browsers than Safari on iOS is leading to a more fragmented future and their double standards are finally showing. We will explore the muddy water around Apple's war against the web, look at some potential solutions and I'll mix in some of my personal opinions as well. I'm a full-time front-end developer with painful first-hand experience on this subject. Apple was a hardware company. But declining iPhone sales has forced them to shift more and more onto services, and its biggest service is the App Store. It is the place to find apps on iOS as you don't really have any other practical choice. Or there's one alternative, one way to get content onto an iPhone without going through the infamous app review process. It is a website, and it can be accessed with your favorite browser, most likely Chrome. Or is it? Did you know that there's just one browser on iOS? But Chrome and Firefox are in the App Store. No, that is just Safari with a skin. Apple is not allowing any other browser on iOS, period. This means that all other browsers are limited by what iOS, Safari, allows them to do, and that is not much. It has become the worst major browser after Internet Explorer died. This is all done on purpose by Apple in order to make the web less appealing. Now yes, that is a really bold claim. Let's rewind a bit and see why. This is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. <laughs> this is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. The first iPhone did not have an app store and the web was in full focus. Now, let's take a look at an internet communications device. It's part of iPhone. Apple, with Steve Jobs at the helm, actually pushed for web standards like HTML5 in order to get better content and kill Flash. Jobs openly attacked Flash in a letter in 2010 where he said that Apple is betting on the web and not Flash. He died a year later and Apple has since chosen to remove the letter as if they want to erase it. His death and his replacement marked a shift for Apple away from the web and towards apps. The App Store launched alongside the second iPhone and it allowed developers to create and sell their own apps on iOS. And we've got the best way to distribute them in the world. A new feature in 2011 allowed for purchases inside apps as well, also known as in-app purchases. The ingenious part is that Apple is taking 30% of all sales for themselves in comparison to normal credit card fees of less than 3%. This especially made sense for smaller developers in the early days of the App Store as Apple provided the infrastructure to develop, test and ship apps to all of its users. The value provided by Apple has decreased as the App Store has grown, with bigger developers establishing themselves and third-party services providing the same or better value. Most of these major developers such as Epic and its app Fortnite doesn't really need all that infrastructure Apple provides, but the 30% tax has stayed the same. This has gotten worse as they can't even tell their users to visit their website in order to bypass the tax. Like how Facebook's app was rejected for just mentioning the tax to its users. That's why, for example, Netflix and Spotify is only allowing users to log into the iOS app and not to start a new subscription. They can't even tell users they have to go to their website in order to subscribe. They're openly fighting back with limited success. Apple is selling less phones each year and have stopped self-reporting on units sold. This means they have to make up the difference somewhere else. 
One solution is to sell more expensive phones and the other is to earn more via the 30% tax. They did both. Apple has an economic incentive to get more developers and users to pay the tax. They can force app developers to pay up, but not websites. The web is advertisement driven and Google controls more than 70% of it. Giving room to websites is giving money to Google, their competitor. Apple needs to get users to switch to apps instead, where they're getting that sweet 30% tax. But how can they achieve this? It's easy, as they control the App Store review guidelines, the law of the land for anyone that wants to get an app onto the App Store. And herein lies the core of the issue. Apps that browse the web must use the appropriate WebKit framework and WebKit JavaScript. This means that all browsers need to use something called WebKit. What is that exactly? WebKit is the browser engine for Safari, like how Chrome uses Blink and V8 on anything outside iOS. The engine is what actually transforms HTML, CSS and JavaScript to an interactive application. The capabilities of the engine determines what features a browser supports, like HTML5 and CSS. The rest is the shell or the skin. Apple is only allowing its own browser engine to be used on their platform. That's why Chrome and Firefox are actually Safari with a skin on iOS. And it's even worse than that. Apple is also disabling some key features outside of Safari, like how it has disabled WebRTC for Chrome and Firefox on iOS. WebRTC is an awesome standard that allows for great video conversations directly in the browser. This makes Chrome and Firefox even less competitive than Safari, creating an uneven playing field. Safari has become the worst major browser in terms of web technology support now that IE is dying. This is done on purpose. The team behind the browser is purposely kept small and unable to keep up with the ever-expanding web. Alex Russell is a senior software engineer at Google and he addressed this very point in a great talk at Frontiers 2019. This means that the cap is on, is being set by what Apple is willing to invest. And that investment, I, I'm sad to say, uh, is extraordinarily low. Now, this is not a ding on any of the good people who spend their life working on WebKit at, and Safari at Apple. They are pound for pound, probably, the best web engineers on the planet. And I say that, you know, working with an entire team of people uh, who I think would aspire to that claim. Apple hires amazing people and then they starve the team. This is a strategic choice. So Safari sets a hard cap on what's possible um, because Apple underinvests in it. And no browser vendor can get past that today. All browsers on iOS are limited but what WebKit can do and they're at the mercy of Apple's willingness to invest. There are also examples of how other aspects are focused more on than the engine, like Apple's push for privacy. It's great that a company is taking a hard stance on users' privacy, but some of the elements feel like they're a tool to promote apps. A good example of this is the new seven day rule. That's where any website you forget to use for seven days will forget who you are and you have to log in all over again. This makes permanently logged in apps a lot more enticing. Apple's philosophy is that a website is just a temporary stop on the way to a permanent app. A surprise update to Fortnite in August defied Apple by bypassing the glorious tax by offering a direct in-game purchase using credit cards. Apple and Google quickly retaliated by banning Fortnite, walking right into Epic's trap. A lawsuit against Apple and Google was filed immediately alongside a media campaign. Epic had it all planned out, but Apple retaliated fiercely by trying to ban Epic's game engine, the Unreal Engine, that's used by a lot of iOS games. Apple was stopped from banning the game engine by a judge, but Apple banned all of Epic's other games instead. They are sending a message to everyone thinking of violating their rules by making an example. Epic punched Apple right in the money bag and it's showing. Epic Games are actually fighting two battles here. 
The first one is the legal battle and the second is the fight in the court of public opinion. That's where they're trying to convince the public that Apple is in the wrong. Spotify did the same thing a few years ago and Apple fought back and tried to taint Spotify's image. It resulted in a rare public statement by Apple. This is from a US Congress antitrust hearing with Apple CAO. Point is that Apple is the sole decision maker as to whether an app is made available to app users through the Apple Store. Isn't that correct? If it's a native app, yes, sir. If it's a web right. app, no. Okay, thank you. I think that both Epic and Spotify have a really good point here that Apple's App Store is a monopoly. But I also see that Epic and Spotify are using deceptive tactics as they would benefit from Apple losing control. Apple Music is owned by Apple, meaning that they don't pay the tax as it's paid to themselves. This means that Spotify is earning 30% less than Apple Music on iOS. Is that fair? Did you for instance know that Apple Music is also available on Android, being the only real app from Apple on Android? Did you also know that Apple Music for Android is fully bypassing Google's Android tax of 30%? Yes, that's right. Apple is forcing Spotify to pay on iOS and circumventing it themselves on Android. A beautiful double standard. They do this by requiring users on Android to add payment options directly, like credit cards, and benefiting from an exemption in Google's in-app purchase rules. This works as Google is more focused on getting games to pay the tax than music apps. But Google just announced a change to the policy that will require Apple Music to pay up next year. This change will also affect Spotify and Netflix in the same way. Amazon Prime and Canal Plus are only paying half of the normal tax due to their immense size and bargaining power. Epic, Spotify and Sonos have now teamed up against Apple and Spotify have even gotten an EU antitrust investigation started. Apple has grown a walled garden and the web is unfortunately on the outside. What is a walled garden? Imagine that one day you get an iPhone. It's your first Apple product, and you're quickly pushed towards using Apple services like iCloud and Apple Music. They just work so great with your iPhone, just as if they were built into the OS. Then, one day, you need a new laptop. You could get another Windows PC, but then you would not be able to seamlessly access your iCloud family photos or your Apple Music library. Getting a MacBook becomes so much more enticing as it just works together with your iPhone. This is a walled garden and it's amazing until you want to get out. Most of Apple's services are intentionally not on competing platforms. Changing to Android means that you will lose out on all of your iMessage contacts and iOS apps. This means you're forced to keep buying ever more expensive Apple products. You can't really switch anymore. Apple can't control websites like how it controls its apps, so it has to be placed outside the walled garden. Apple only has three apps on Android and one is just for moving from Android to iOS. Its apps on Android and websites exist more to pull new users into the walled garden than to allow you to escape it. This can be seen in how the best version of these applications are always on iOS. Microsoft wants to get game streaming onto iOS with xCloud and Game Pass. This was recently stopped by Apple as this would introduce an alternative app store. That's not allowed inside the walled garden. Apple actually requires that Microsoft submit each game in Game Pass as a separate app so each could be reviewed independently. This is just exploiting their position to push away competitors. Remember that Apple got their own game service, Apple Arcade. Valve also faced the same issues when they first tried to launch on iOS. Apple has too much control over the App Store. The iPhone is the most important part of so many users' life and it's too important for one company to control without oversight. Apple can do whatever they want 
and the first victims are usually developers and the entire web. This has unsurprisingly angered a lot of people, companies and governments. Apple is currently under several antitrust investigations by the EU and US Justice Department. Our evidence suggests that your company has used its power to harm your rivals and boost your own business. This is fundamentally unfair and harms small businesses that rely on you to reach customers and stifles the innovation that is the lifeblood of our economy. Ultimately, it reduces the competition and choices that are made available to consumers, and that is a great concern to all of us. And I yield back. This could lead to the company and App Store being broken up into several smaller competing companies. Apple is also facing class action lawsuits from several developers in addition to the one from Epic Games. Apple is under assault from multiple fronts and it's not looking good for them. Several large app developers are also fighting back by defying whatever part of the rules they can get away with. Netflix, Spotify and the Hey email app doesn't offer the ability to pay for subscriptions in the app anymore and no link to any place to do that either. Android allows for installation of apps directly and even the usage of alternative app stores with relative ease. iOS is actually allowing for alternative stores like the Tutu app via a loophole but it's really hard to use so the vast majority of users are only in the official store. Wouldn't it be awesome if you could make one application that runs everywhere? One codebase that serves all of your users? That's unfortunately not how it works anymore with Android and iOS. A lot of companies have to custom make their application three times one for native iOS, one for native Android and one last time as a website. That's ridiculous, recreating the same features three times over. You will get awkward moments where that feature is not implemented on iOS yet. The web is the one platform that's available everywhere, but we're going against it and creating a more fragmented and closed future. This is even what helped kill Windows phones. No one wanted to create the same application a fourth time. Going away from universal websites means killing competing platforms before they have a chance. Some developers just want to make one version, but they have a lot of roadblocks to overcome. They could create a hybrid app, that's an app written with web technologies, but deployed as an app. Being powered by web technologies means that the app can be used on both iOS and Android, but Apple has started to fight back by denying any framework like React Native from using any native features. This is despite the fact that these apps have to go through the same app review process as native apps. PWAs are websites that can be installed as apps directly from the browser. This allows them to bypass the entire review process. Apple doesn't really like this, so they're strictly limiting PWAs capabilities. They have limited space, can be uninstalled automatically by iOS if not used for some time, and can't benefit from great features that native apps have, like push notifications and background fetching. All of this make PWA apps second-class citizens at best and not a competitive choice. This is a star comparison to Android where PWAs have access to most core features that apps use. A consequence of this is that PWAs are significantly more popular in regions where Android is dominating. Remember that a website is just a temporary stop on the way to a permanent native app in Apple's eyes. Apple has some really good points against websites. Performance can be bad, privacy is just an afterthought, and advertisements are everywhere. Small devices, like phones, need some custom love. You can't just scale down a desktop website and hope it works. Native apps are tailored for iOS and it really shows when compared to a generic website. However, this is not an excuse for Apple to make websites unable to compete with native apps. It's possible to make websites work great on mobile devices without having to reinvent the wheel on each platform. 
Developers should choose the best tool for the job and not what Apple or Google is forcing them to use in order to get access to the best features. A lack of choice for developers is killing so many great ideas before they had a chance. Sometimes an app is the best choice and sometimes it's a website. We should have the final say, not Apple. Apple's tight control over the App Store might actually help the web, as some developers are forced off the App Store and have to make a website instead. A good example of this is xCloud and Luna. But this doesn't address the real problem of everything being Safari on iOS. So where does this leave us? Apple is slowly killing the web with a series of smaller decisions that result in more and more companies just making an app instead of a website. This is helped by all of the small decisions by Apple to make browsing the web worse than using a native app. The problem gets even worse in countries where iPhones have a large user base and companies really need to support the platform. It quickly becomes a natural decision to make an app instead so we get all of the best features. Apple is a public company and that means that their end goal is always profit. Having full control over its platform is a great way to increase revenue but it also makes the App Store a monopoly. Uh, Mr. Cook with over 100 million iPhone users in the United States alone and with Apple's ownership of the App Store, giving Apple the ability to control which apps are allowed to be marketed to Apple users, you wield immense power over small businesses to grow and prosper. There are no real ways of fighting back for developers within the system. That is one of the core reasons why Apple is under assault from multiple fronts with lawsuits and antitrust investigations. This is really serious for Apple and can have devastating consequences for a company that have built their business model around the App Store. One potential outcome is that the App Store is forced to become a separate company. That would mean they can't use the 30% tax to fund its offering of free Apple apps in the same way anymore but it might be necessary to level the playing field. Opening up for other browsers could have the same negative effect for Apple, but it will also bring along more innovation, choice and lower prices. More choice for developers and users is great for everyone except Apple's monopoly. The solution to the core problem is easy. Just allow for other browsers and make the web a first class citizen on iOS. User choice and competition is critical for innovation and help prevent technological stagnation. Safari has somewhat stopped innovating and the web is suffering severely as a consequence. It might turn out that users still prefer apps, but the market should decide that, not Apple. Just remember, Apple is fighting for its life right now, and they're unlikely to change on any of this unless forced by its users developers or governments thank you for watching i hope you found this new type of content really interesting i'm working on a similar piece on google's control over the web as well so please subscribe if that sounds interesting so what do you think of apple's war against the web let's talk in the comments Thank you for watching. I hope you found this new type of video really interesting.